Okay, we're just gonna wait a few more minutes so that it can, we can make sure that it's actually live for everybody. Okay, it looks like okay. success. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the July 13th Public Design Commission meeting. If you're watching on YouTube right now, uh, you can find uh, links in the video description to the public testimony sign-in form, instructions for giving public testimony, and uh, a link to the meeting agenda, which also has links to the presentations for the public hearing items. And if you'd like to give public testimony on any of the three public hearing items, please sign in uh, using the link in the video description and then join the Zoom meeting. And after you join the Zoom meeting, please be sure to close your YouTube video to eliminate any feedback. Public testimony will be limited to three minutes per usual. Okay, Signy, we're ready to start. All right. uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Signe Nielsen, president of the Public Design Commission. The meeting, uh, the public meeting is now commencing. I'll begin with a roll call to confirm commissioner attendance. When I call your name, uh, please say here. Phil Ahrens. Sorry, hold on there. Slow to unmute, sorry. Phil? Here. Lori Hawkinson? Here. Manuel Miranda? Here. Richard Moore? Here. Su Susan Morgenthau? Here. Ethel Sheffer? Here. Meryl Tisch? Uh, Meryl has not joined, so I okay. will, will- Mary Valverde? Here. All right, we have a quorum, thank you. Um, so we'll now um, vote on the consent agenda. We have before us items 27535 to 27546. Staff has noted my recusal from item 27541. Are there any other recusals that are not noted? Uh, okay, good. Uh, for the record, there are no further recusals. So I'm now gonna call on a vote. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote for the consent agenda. You may approve or reject um, or abstain from uh, individual projects. Uh, Phil. Yes. Lori. It's not un unmuting. Yes. Okay. Uh, Manuel. Approve. Richard. Approve. Susan. Approve. Ethel. Approve. Meryl is still absent. Uh, and Mary. Approve. Okay, we have um, unanimous approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, so we're now moving on to the public hearing. Um, and per standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony if there is any, and then um, we can follow up with questions, deliberate and vote. So the first item on the agenda um, are items 27547 and 27548, the construction of a maintenance building and comfort station in Michaela's Bayswater Park in Queens. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube now and you would like to give public testimony on either of these projects, please do sign in using the link that's in the video description and then join the meeting via Zoom. And that the instructions for doing that are also uh, linked in the video description. Uh, as a reminder, once you've joined Zoom, please close your YouTube uh, video. Thank you. Great, so, so who's presenting? Grace will, uh, yes, Grace, can you give control to the presenter, to Jordan? Okay, and then um, unmute Jordan.
Can someone unmute? Un un I'm on mute. I've unmuted. <laughs> I hey, can, him. You, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Do you want to test to see if the slides are working? <laughs> yeah. Do I have control? Yeah. Um, did I think Nancy wanted to give an intro? Uh, that right. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Nancy um, Prince. I'm the Chief of Landscape Architecture at Parks. In October of 2019, the Commission reviewed and approved our plans for a Michaelis Bayswater Park. Uh, the park was designed by NV5 Landscape Architects. The park on the bay side of the Rockways is a large community park with both traditional active areas and natural marsh. In October, you saw and approved the locations of the two new buildings, a new comfort station that's a bit larger than our standard and a combination comfort station maintenance facility. We're back today with the design of the two buildings. Um, NV5 has been working with WXY architects who designed these buildings. Um, following the presentation, the designers, myself and Jorge Prado, the director of architecture can answer any questions. Uh, WXY Architects will now present the designs. Hi everyone, I'm Jordan Channer, an architectural designer at WXY. Also on the call is Claire Wise, principal at WXY. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, we're really building on the work NV5 did with the addition of an MNO building and a comfort station. The MNO building comes in at around 2,600 square feet and the comfort station is much smaller at 660 square feet. I'm trying to, ah, there we go. Um, so the MNO building is located to the north, which is really the back of the, the back entrance of the park. Um, it's just off Bay 32nd Street, which is this really, which is really a residential street. So the neighborhood context is really two-story um, single family homes. Um, the MNO building area is surrounded by this open, rugged landscape. It, right here, you're more aware of nature. You're more aware of the bay to the south and to the north, there's a natural reserve, natural resource area. Um, in contrast, the, the comfort station is located at the main entrance where most of the park program activity will be, um, just off Beach Channel Drive. Um, here it's more expressly urban um, with Beach Channel Drive being commercial in this area. Um, and in NV5's most recent plans, the, the area is more intimate with lush, uh, mature trees and on, on weekends, it really comes alive right in, in the existing with kids because it's this uh, playground area, sports area, and that will be maintained in NP5 plans. Um, so we raised the building to plus 12 elevation in response to the projected impact of the 100 year floodplain. The base flood elevation is around 10 feet, but we raised it to 12 feet uh, to buffer any externalities, storm surges, et cetera. Um, so as far as goals, as mentioned, we're really responding to the need for an MNO facility for park staff on site. Um, we're also adding additional public restrooms for this Northern portion of the park. And of course, we want the building to comply with the specific codes and guidelines outlined on the slide here. Um, so the, the building, and let me know if you can see the mouse, will be around here. And you can really see how the, the tree line of the natural resource area and the two-story residential buildings create an edge right here. You can also get a sense of the scale of the area. Off the side, you get the sense that it's really this open landscape um, with only the NYCHA building across the bay as a, a visual edge, really. 
Um, and this panoramic really shows how the natural resource area and the two-story residential buildings frame this edge at this corner by Dwight Avenue. Um, so zooming in, we can get a closer look at the site programming. So there's two, there's a, a vehicular and pedestrian entrance to the maintenance and operations yard. Um, leads, that's, that's for park staff only and leads to the entrance to the MNO building um, to the east and to the west uh, are where the public restrooms are and it faces more the, the park area and it's accessed from within the park mainly. Sorry. Um, the, the fencing plan shows uh, an orsa grill that screens the yard. It's a more opaque louvered fence. Um, and there's also a, a planter that's also to screen the yard from the tennis courts. The fencing around the tennis courts is a, a DPR standard chain link fence, much more transparent than the orsa grill. And the accessibility site plan looks at the um, access to the building on both sides from the MNO for from the MNO yard for park park staff and from the park for the public for access to the public bathrooms. Um, so, so the plan is organized uh, with DPR staff area uh, with lockers and staff restrooms and storage to the east area and to the west. Again, the more public side has the public bathrooms. And the roof is a double curvature roof in that it, it curves in two directions, in two axes, and it um, collects water in the middle along here. Um, it peaks on these edges and dips on these edges, but this will be clearer in the elevations and the sections and the renderings. Um, there's also a hatch for roof maintenance access from the garage area and dome light, dome skylights um, for more daylight penetration in the structure. Um, so as mentioned, we raised uh, the, our design flood elevation is 12 feet. Um, we, we chose a sailor or soldier course brick pattern uh, for the facade with a sandy color palette. And here you can see the green roof curvature in that it slopes this way, but it also slopes that way. So it, it bends into axes. Um, the clerestory roof uh, opens up to the garage area and it's screened with a perforated uh, steel panel. Uh, that's typical of the compost station prototype. On the south elevation, uh, the tertiary window opens into the staff area. And this penetration is an exhaust louver from the mech room, both screened with the perforated steel panel. This is the more public facing facade. Um, Again, the first three windows above the public bathrooms are screened with a perfect with the same perforated steel panel. Um, there's accessible an accessible ramp access running along the tennis courts uh, to the 12 foot high platform to the 12 foot level design elevation platform. Um, the next, this is the more this is the DPR access. Facade. Uh, you have roller doors for vehicular access to the garage storage area. This storefront acts as the pedestrian access to the staff area. And above it, there's a, the, the same perforated steel panel that screens an, a roller shutter for the, the entrance and also an exhaust loophole for a heat pump. Uh, See that configuration here, the perforated steel panel screening, the heat pump, and the, the roller shuttle. You can also see, you know, the DPR access side with this procession through the staff area, the locker rooms, and the staff bathrooms. And over here, the more public side, 
um, which faces the park um, with access to the public bathrooms. And here you can see really the structure of the double curvature roof um, geometry with just really standard open web steel joist arrayed um, planar with a planar array, um, just adjusted angles to create that double curvature. Uh, Claire will take up and talk about the renderings and the material palette. So I just want to add to what um, I think Jordan and I were trying to achieve in uh, a pretty open landscape in this area, uh, a very utilitarian building, but something that would kind of reflect what will be a marsh and kind of all season. So this sort of has a kind of uh, reflected what maybe winter grasses in terms of the color palette might look like, but also the fact that you have a lot of light colored houses and they're all kind of um, relatively simple. So this simple building really focuses on its green roof, on having a public and private side. Uh, I know there were some um, uh, comments uh, about getting ADA access on both sides of the building, and that's something that we'll work on in the next phase as we go into working more with the landscape architects. Uh, but the idea was that, it, you know, just to clarify, it drains to the edges. There's two low points and two high points. And so we'll be able to bring the anything left over from the green roof into the landscape in terms of drainage. Next get in that slide, Jordan. So I just want to show you the sides of this. And so that what we hoped would create out of a simple box some sense of inflection in the roof and at the same time a sort of kind of screen-like quality, even using the standard glazed brick with the skinnier lines made by the vertical, like the vertical stripe almost sand-like in color with the black and gray. Next one. And equally, you know, this is the view that really you're getting as you approach it. Um, kind of, you can see the Orso Grill screening and, you know, what is a kind of civic industrial building. Uh, next slide. And those are the sort of the coloration. Again, the color gray to be sympathetic to the metals and then the black for highlights and the sand colored glazed brick and the green roof and the perforated steel panel and these dome skylights that actually we, we also uh, use in the comfort station in the Rock at um, Bar Rockaway Park. And then I'm gonna pass over to Jordan to talk about the comfort station smaller that's in the trees at the gateway entrance. Right, so, so as mentioned, the comfort station is, you know, to the south, which is where the main entrance to the park is. And it's just off Beach Channel Drive, which is this main arterial road in the Rockaway Peninsula. And it's just across from this commercial plaza. So this area is definitely more urban in its context. Um, and the goals, um, as mentioned, is to, create, is to add um, public bathrooms to the main area of activity um, in the Bayswater Park. And of course, we want the building to comply with the outline guidelines, codes, and regulations. Um, so these are existing site photos and the design has obviously changed since NV5, you know, worked on it. Um, but highlighted right here is where the comfort station would be and it's just off Beach Channel Drive. You see this, you know, fairly generous sidewalk for, the, for Bar Rockaway, a bike lane, um, just more pedestrian leading and more urban on this side. Um, and the, this is really the character of the park, which is a lot of playgrounds, a lot of um, sports fields, very active on the weekends for kids. Um, and again, Beach Channel Drive, as I mentioned, was the main art, one of the main 
east-west arterials in the, along the Rockaway Peninsula, um, bike lanes, um, you know, two-way two -way bike lanes, very urban context uh, in contrast to the more residential MNO building. Uh, so again, we raised the comfort station to plus 12 elevation, again, in response to the impact of the 100-year floodplain. Um, on this side, on the east side, you meet the platform on grade, and on the west, you step up to the 12-foot elevation. Um, we incorporated a green roof, and the building is also tucked into the, the landscape about one foot. Um, we, we really, it's really an adaptation of the prototype, the comfort station prototype that Parks had developed. Um, only we added an extra stall in each bathroom and expanded the mechanical room. Um, and of course, we, you know, played with the brick pattern. It's really an inversion of the MNO building in response to its urban context. So the base is now the, the charcoal and, you know, we have the tan and gray stripes um, going through it. Here you can see the building tucked really into the elevation at grade here. It's about 13 and 12 on the platform. Um, and as it tucks in, we use the base brick uh, where it meets the ground plane. Similar story at the other elevation. And again, typical of the parks compost station prototype. In this view, we really just ex expanded uh, this axis to accommodate an extra stall. And here we expanded the mech room, uh, yeah, which, which increased the total width of the comfort station. And Claire will take over and talk about uh, the building in its context. Yeah, so I think this um, helps. The rendering from NV5 of the proposed compared to where you are today in terms of the gateway. And if we go to the next just series of renderings, you can see that the, there's on the kind of public uh, face, the entry door face for the washroom facility, there is a lot of metal detailing in term, and the perforated metal. So the gray picks up that and then the darker, I think we thought with the sand would really work within the grove of trees nicely and still connect to the other building in the sense of it being one park, but you cannot see one building from the other. And then going through the other facades. Uh, oh, I thought there was, oh, right, just that view. And then you can see the palette here again with the green roof and the, the dark colored lighting. And I think there's another uh, image right after this one that juxtaposes both Bill, oh, it, it shows that there, the difference in patterning. The m and building, we're doing the vertical stack bond. The comfort station being a standard prototype um, has the already determined um, horizontal stack bond, which we think is sort of nice to use both. And next one, so this shows both of them together, uh, how to kind of um, create um, a sympathetic, but kind of different both for the scale, but also the location. And I think we're ready for any questions. Um, thank you, Claire and Jordan. Uh, so uh, Carrie, has anyone signed up to testify on this? No, nobody has. Uh, I just wanna make a short announcement in, in case someone's watching on YouTube, if you are watching right now and you'd like to give testimony on either of these projects, please sign in via the form, which you can find a link to that form in the video description. And you can find instructions for joining the meeting in the video description as well. Thank you. Um, would any, uh, do any commissioners have questions or comments? Um, I'll just start to say that um, I think these are really, really um, 
very beautifully designed buildings, both of them. And I really appreciate the attention that you've taken to look at the standard comfort station design and kind of take it somewhere else a little bit as much as is possible given the constraints of that. Um, and I also think the M&O building, um, I know I had a comment about vertical versus horizontal, but I, you know, I'm, I think it's actually a really nice pairing. And I, it's interesting when you're saying that you don't see them from each other. And I, um, I think the design, I hope it is, does become a pilot for the, you know, working building with the restroom and the m and building anyway, because I think that, you know, adding this roof with its um, gesture, both to allow us to see the green roof, which is really great. And also the skylights, I really appreciate. So, I mean, I, I think they're, you know, you guys, you know, thought a lot and are very careful about uh, the design here. And I really appreciate it. Um, there was the comment, I know you addressed it about the handicap access. We are just wondering if that could come in from the other side, if that's at all possible, but I'm sure you've thought of it or are looking at that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, okay, I'll just say that uh, I really appreciate, in addition to what Lori uh, mentioned, the responsiveness to the context. I think that uh, the, the, the buildings happen to be in quite close proximity to the uh, the buildings to the uh, buildings around them. That uh, and so I think that's a that's important um, in in this situation. I have a general question for Park, not really for um, WXY. Um, in light of um, kind of where we are right now in trying to promote increased sanitary habits. Um, Parks always has drinking fountains on the outside of their comfort stations. Has there ever been a thought about putting um, wash stations on the exterior? Hi, this is uh, Jorge Prado, the Director of Architecture at Parks. Um, so I, I can respond to your question in the sense that uh, explicitly in my tenure, no, uh, we haven't had these uh, discussions. We are in the process now though, of re-evaluating our approaches to all of our uh, plumbing fixtures. And um, we will be adding that to our list of uh, items to discuss internally and then eventually uh, with the larger group. So yes, uh, we're, we're looking at everything as it stands, but um, no, I don't think there's been a history uh, of park buildings having wash stations on the exterior of the building. Oh, no, no, clearly not. But I'm just, you know, I just wonder whether, um, you know, in the future, whether that would, uh, I, I'd be interested kind of in how many people are using the restrooms simply to, to clean themselves up and how many people are actually using the restroom for the restroom. Anyway, it's just a, just a thought. Mm -hmm. um, Understood. It's a good comment that we'll put it on our list. So thank mm -hmm. you. So um, I can't see the full screen here, Carrie. So has anyone raised their hand? No, no one has raised their hand and no one has signed up on our form to give testimony. I'm just going to refresh it once more. I don't see it. So if anyone wants to say anything, great. There's a bird oh, okay. that's to speak, but other <laughs> um, please do raise your hand now. Okay. If uh, go ahead. Somebody, somebody has some beautiful birds chirping. Um, all right, so let's um, take they're, a roll they're, call. They're my birds. <laughs> I love it, Phil. They're speaking out because I can no longer uh, um, propose a motion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I'll take a roll call vote on items 27547 and 27548. Um, and I guess we're going to take separate votes. Is that right, Carrie? Uh, so we'll just vote together and you can say approve both. Okay. So you can approve both, reject one, uh, approve the other. So, um, Phil. Approve both. Lori. Approve both. Manuel. Approve both. Richard. Approve both. Susan. Approve both. Ethel. Approve both. Um, Mary. Approve both. And myself, 
approve both. So that is, uh, I believe that um, uh, Meryl is still absent. Is that? Yes, she she was having technical difficulties, but so she's not on. Okay, so um, it's unanimous. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, we are um, going to move on now um, to item 27549. Um, wait, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you. We'll wait for the project to come up, but it's item 27549, reconstruction of Donegan Playground in Staten Island. And if, so if anyone's watching on YouTube right now and would like to give public testimony on this project, please sign in and you can find a link to the sign in form in the video description under the YouTube video. And I'll then go ahead and join the Zoom meeting. Uh, instructions for doing that are also in the video description. And once you've joined, please close the YouTube channel to eliminate feedback. Thank you. So I believe we have Jordan Weber and David McConnell presenting. Uh, correct, good morning. Hi, this, this is Dave McConnell uh, from New York City Parks. I think Jordan is signing on right now uh, or shortly, uh, but I'll give, uh, I'll give a little intro as she's, uh, as she's getting herself uh, into the, the Zoom meeting. Uh, so good morning, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Dave McConnell. Uh, I'm the Director of Landscape Architecture for Staten Island. Uh, and I will be joined shortly by Jordan Weber, uh, the designer for Dongan Playground. Uh, for a little bit of background on the park, um, it, the design as you see it now, or the park as you see it now, is built in the mid-1980s. Uh, it's in a neighborhood that's prone to flooding. Uh, and the core of the playground itself is uh, lowered about a foot and a half from street elevation. Uh, a main goal of this project was to raise the most valuable assets of the park above flood levels. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a, a main driver here. Uh, through the process, we worked very closely with the community and with the adjacent school, uh, and the project was approved by the community board uh, without any issues. Uh, they were happy with the design, no changes. Uh, so uh, with that, I would normally hand it off to Jordan. Uh, I'm not sure if she's signed on here yet. She's coming on right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. It may take a second. Sure. Jordan? Hi. Okay, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Jordan, I just gave a little uh, little intro for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm officially handing the reins over to you to walk them through the design. All right, great. Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Weber, and I am an assistant landscape architect with the Parks Department. Is the screen progressing? It's not on my side. Not, no, not yet. Uh, Grace, do you, can you make sure she has control? With okay, try again. It says it's waiting, waiting for you to take control. Okay, it says I can control, but it's it's not moving for me. Um, try clicking or using the arrow keys. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so the goals of this project will be to upgrade the active play capacity for the park in the neighborhood, as well as mitigating the flood issues on site, uh, provide programming for people of all ages, and increase accessibility to all the park amenities. So the site's located in the northeastern edge of Staten Island um, and set from the beach by a few blocks. We're well within the floodplain and the projected floodplain for this project. And we're also within the MS4 area, which will affect how we handle the stormwater. 
Uh, the site is situated in a mostly residential area, but we are near a hospital in, highlighted in the blue. There are a few other parks nearby, some ongoing projects, uh, most notably the Ocean Breeze Complex and the FDR Boardwalk. So looking at the existing conditions of the park, um, this is a JOP project connected with um, PS52 that you can see down at the bottom edge there. Um, there's an existing seating area along Dungan Hills Avenue with some trees integrated. Uh, there's also an existing comfort station on site that'll remain through this project. Um, there's a cross access through the site connecting Dongan Hills Avenue on the west and Buell Avenue on the east. And to the south of this, there's some open space and existing game tables, uh, which are situated below the street level. It's sunken below. Um, South of the project limit line, there's an asphalt schoolyard that's connected to the, to the school. And then north of the axis is the main play area. Um, this area is all recessed about a foot and a half below street level. So the major circulation through the site is happening in this east-west axis. Um, there's some pavement damage through that area because of vehicle circulation. Um, the other circulation is happening mostly on the edges or across the site. Um, after school pickup is done in the play area south of our project limit line um, and parents enter that space through Buell Avenue and then move along that sidewalk to enter the playground after school. Um, there's a fair bit of damage to the existing safety surface and the asphalt in these lowered areas because of the flooding issues that are occurring. So here you can really clearly see everything in the darker blue is um, below the base flood elevation. It's all pretty susceptible to the flooding. Everything in the lighter blue is the projected floodplain. So before we dig too much into the proposed design, this is just a, a quick idea that um, most of our proposal will be raising the site above these flood elevations. You can see within the neighborhood context, we are slightly higher, um, but the site is still obviously facing a lot of the same issues as the rest of the neighborhood. So looking at the existing tree canopy, um, there's a fairly strong canopy on site and we wanted to maintain the majority of the existing trees. We will have four design removals and those are mostly um, located along the axis. So these are some photos of the existing conditions, um, the existing seating area and the comfort station along Dongan Hills Avenue. Uh, the main park entrance from Dongan Hills Avenue, you can clearly see across the entire site, um, as well as the sunken game area. You can see how it's situated below the rest of the, the street elevations. This is the existing play space, um, a photo taken from the central axis. Um, you can see some of the pavement damage and the changes in elevation. Another view highlighting how we're below street level. And then the existing entrances along Buell Avenue, which are the major entrances after school. So during scoping, we met with students from PS52 to discuss their ideas for the site. Um, they really focused on expanding the play equipment and uh, meeting the needs of kids of all abilities and ages. Um, they also requested some unprogrammed space for free play. So here we'll see the proposed schematic design. Um, we expanded the tree beds along Dongan Hills Avenue while maintaining some of the open entry points that existed and were heavily used. The game tables, which um, currently are used for homework, were moved to a more central location and the comfort station is that will remain as is, is located right beside. Um, south of the access, where it used to have um, the sunken game table area is now a raised synthetic turf space. Uh, so this is providing an area for unprogrammed play. The east-west access is maintained, um, keeping the circulation across the site intact. Uh, two to five area is enclosed near the game tables in the comfort station. And most of the play space is dedicated to the five to 12 play and swings. The two age groups are divided by an elevated platform shown in the light gray. This will be a concrete raised platform um, separating and connecting the two spaces with elevation. So um, this platform can be accessed on both sides via a ramp. 
there are also stairs near the comfort station. Uh, the 5 to 12 post and deck play connects directly to this ramp, which raises all of the accessible play opportunities and creates some multi-level play experiences. And then we also um, pull some play on the 5 to 12 area from this area also. Um, so because of the changes in elevations and raising most of the space, all of the play equipment is accessible. So looking at those new elevations, remembering that the base flood elevation was at 12 feet, um, a majority of the site is now raised above it. The platform where we're pulling the play from is about uh, three feet above some of the surrounding areas and um, we're adjusting to meet all of those ramps. So looking again at this diagram, the blue area being in the flood elevation uh, for the proposed design, that's only 26% of the site and it's mostly planting. Um, in the proposed area, we um, have some of the play equipment, but we don't expect this to be an issue throughout the lifetime of the site. And in the white, you can see the areas that are fully be high and dry through the lifetime of, of the playground. Mm -hmm. So this is a section looking through that elevated platform that divides the two play spaces looking towards the five to 12 play. Um, you can see down at the bottom of the platform, we are meeting flush with the, with the um, surrounding safety surface. So we're raising everything above street level by about a foot and a half. Um, at its height, we're about three feet above the surrounding conditions, giving a nice high platform for um, the accessible mm. too. And all of this will be accessible via ramps. Looking the other direction towards um, the east-west axis, um, you can see how the play equipment is connecting to this elevated platform, um, but keeping everything else nice and, nice and smooth and accessible. And then we'll also pull a connection on the other side to the smaller kids play area. So on the aerial, you can really see how those spaces connect and how the circulation moves throughout. We're maintaining most of the existing canopy, creating nice shady stretches of benches, um, and numerous accessible play opportunities. As far as fencing, we are keeping the edges um, still very open um, visually like they are now, specifically at all of the pedestrian access points. Um, we'll be using medium three foot fences, both steel and a vertical post that matches the play equipment anywhere there are grade changes or is needed around play areas. Everything shown in the green are gonna be low planting fences. So a quick look at some of the play equipment. You can see all of the, all of the ramped play and other pieces for the five to 12 age group. And then the smaller sensory focus units for the two to five year play. We'll be using our park standard materials, the 1964 benches, um, our standard steel picket fences, and then incorporating a vertical pipe rail fence along the play components to match the play structures. Uh, a majority of the paving will be concrete. We'll also have uh, a standard safety surface and then the synthetic turf and a uh, drinking fountain will be connected to the existing comfort station. Using a native plant palette um, that will be able to handle the different weather conditions on the site. And mostly just opening up the planting pits. So we're increasing permeability through planting alone by 10%. We'll also have an area below the synthetic turf um, to accommodate extra stormwater storage. So I'll look once more at the proposed design. Uh, thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Jordan. Um, do we, first of all, do we have any um, testimony, public testimony? We do not. We, no one has signed up to give public testimony, so we can okay. move forward with commissioner questions. Okay. So, um, questions, comments, commissioners? I'll take that as a cue. No one um, has raised their hand, so. Okay, I had, um, I had, uh, I guess, two things that 
were of a little concern to me. I mean, I appreciate that this is a joint operated uh, property and so that the majority of kids um, are obviously of the five to 12 uh, age group. Um, but I'm just looking at the two to five and it seems, I mean, I understand why you have picnic tables and, and proximity to the comfort station, but do you feel it is sufficiently well kind of monitored that if I were a parent or a caregiver um, that I would have sufficient um, kind of visual and physical uh, uh, protection, I guess, for a little kid that might want to run out and run pretty directly out onto Donegan Hills Avenue? So anyway, that's one question. The other question is, um, I wondered what the dimension was, the clear dimension between, um, as you come in from the Northwest, it appears that you, you walk in and there are a line of benches on either side of you. It feels a little bit like running a gauntlet. Um, and so I just wondered what that dimension was, clear dimension between the benches. Those are my questions. This, uh, this is Nancy from Parks. I, I think that's, uh, um, we'll take that comment about making sure that uh, young kids are secure. Um, I know that it has all the benches on the side near the entrance so that you could look at the um, kids. You likely sit there and look at the kids um, that are sort of enclosed in the space. Um, and then uh, Jordan, if you know the dimension between those two um, two benches, it does look, uh, looks like it might be tight, but. I mean, maybe you want to do a yes. stagger kind of, yeah. so it doesn't feel quite so much like a gauntlet. Um, but I, I mean, I really like the, uh, I think the, you've, uh, your forms are very um, pleasing and um, accommodate uh, the existing vegetation in a way that's, uh, a, you know, really transformative of, of what the, um, the way the park was uh, designed originally. And so I uh, very much appreciate that. Um, I also just would like to make a general comment or a general observation. And that is, I found it fascinating that the children that you spoke to asked for unprogrammed areas. Um, and I think parks should sort of take that to heart. Because sometimes I feel, and I know I've made this comment in the past, that our, our spaces are getting over-programmed. And this age group in particular, um, and now, uh, you know, we have many more sort of wheeled options for kids to enjoy um, that, uh, you know, we should, we should recognize this. And, and I'm sure the pressure comes largely from adults but I just think it's important to listen to the kids here who say, you know, we just want a place um, to be able to run around and be flexible and, you know, whatever. So I really appreciate that you listen to the kids here. And I think it's a, you know, kind of a larger lesson for, for some future parks. So. Um, I, thought, I thought that was really interesting that that came out in your kind of engagement with the, with the stakeholders. So. Um, I'm glad you brought that point up too. I, I'd have to say I, I uh, appreciate your appreciation here. Um, one of the, the great uh, attributes that the current park design has is that it, it actually has a lot of open space, right? And so the kids really do use it like that. They run around and they use the, the space that's there. And so when the um, when the request came in to rebuild the playground and everybody, you know, there's there's always a push to have oh an exciting playground and to nibble away at that space to just run around. Um, and so, you know, the conversations with the kids uh, and seeing uh, Jordan and I spent uh, a good amount of time uh, at the park. Uh, we actually went there uh, just to sit and watch how the kids used it, watch how the parents used it. Um, and their their request to have space to run around uh, really was uh, shown in the way they use it. And so it was important to us as we went through the design that we maintain that. Um, so thanks. Thanks for the comment. 
Sure. I, re- I think that, that uh, I guess it was South um, Western Teardrop Nook is going to be, I think, incredibly successful. And I like that it is really contained um, and, the, you know, people pass um, to the north of it. I think that's going to be really a, a very special um, space within that, within the park. So, um, all right, are there, um, Carrie, do you see any other comments or raised hands? No, I, I don't see any raised hands. Okay, so now let us move on to a roll call vote. Um, um, this is on item 27549. Somebody's dinging. Um, so, commissioners, when I call your name, please state um, your um, preference to approve, reject, table, or abstain. And if you want to have any um, specific comments on those votes, please feel free to do so. So, Phil, I'll start with you. I think so. I'm. He's. I think he may have stepped away. So, if you want to continue okay, I'll with come, the others, come back to him, Lori. Approve. Can you hear me? Oh, he's back. There he is, Phil. Okay, I'm good. Okay, I good, approve. excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manuel. Approve. Richard. Approve. Susan. Approve. Ethel. Approve. And Mary. Approve. And myself approve. So it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And we will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.